And uh, I said, look, I have childcare issues. Could I please bring my daughter? She'll just hang out in the kitchen or whatever. And, um, and they're like, yeah, of course, no problem at all. And so uh, total lie. I had no childcare issues whatsoever. I was like, Sophie, do you want to go with me to the conjuring house? <laughs> yep. And she's like, oh my God, yes. I'm like, you're coming with dad to work. Let's yep. go. What up, peeps? This is the Scary Movie Project. I am your host, Matt, and welcome to this exciting episode of Legends and Lore. <laughs> we are joined today by Jeff Belanger, who is the host of New England Legends, the host of the New England Legends podcast and television series you can find on PBS, on Amazon Prime, and your lo- like anywhere you get podcasts. i um, been doing it for a very long time. I don't want to say anything and speak over you, so Jeff, why don't you say hello to everybody and tell us what it is about this great program that you have. Uh, hello. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Matt. Um, so yeah, my name is Jeff Belanger, and I love all things spooky and weird and ghosts, monsters, aliens, UFOs, anything that bumps in the night. And I've been fortunate to make a career out of it. Um, uh, I started as a, a journalist writing for newspapers and looking for Halloween features around October. And then that turned into a website, which turned into writing books, which turned into uh, working on the show Ghost Adventures ever since episode one. And then doing my own thing with uh, New England Legends. And um, it started as a television series back in 2013 and turned into a podcast just over five years ago. And it's been uh, every week we challenge ourselves with, can we find some new weird story somewhere in New England and sort of make like a little mini audio documentary about it. And um, we haven't missed a week in five years. So it's been quite a journey. That is impressive. That is awesome. Um, we love everything that goes bump the night here on, on this show. So yeah, that's that's perfect. So I love New England. I visit it often. Um, if you haven't, shame on you. You must go, everyone out there. But what I wanted to do was talk about a couple of things that I thought of. A couple, just three stories that I that I love from the area. One is sort of a story, I guess. It could be parts of Canada, maybe in other places, but we'll touch on it. But I kind of wanted to go and regionally. We'll follow ourselves up north. So. One of the first things that I can think of is the story of the Perrin family. And if no one knows who the Perrin family is, they are the family in Rhode Island, is it Harrisville, um, that is the basis for the great 2013 film The Conjuring, which I love and I think was, you know, has spanned the whole universe of films now. So, Jeff, why don't you, what do you know? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that story? So the when I watched The Conjuring, and let me say this, super mm. fun movie. Uh, yeah, loved excellent. it as a work of horror. My daughter and I both love horror movies. She yeah. loved it too. Uh, she's 15 now, and she saw it you know, not long after it came out. So <laughs> she was pretty young. Okay, she was yeah. pretty young. So uh, you know, get her in the family business early. Yes. So that's the first movie that I've watched in my life where I was like, huh, I know every single person being portrayed in this movie in real life. <laughs> So growing up where I did in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, the town next to us was Monroe, Connecticut, still is Monroe, Connecticut. um, And Ed and Lorraine Warren lived there. So I knew them since I was about 13 years old. Did you ever get to work with them, by the way? So I've interviewed them for projects. Uh, I've attended their lectures. I've been to their house. I've been to their museum. So it's not like I investigated with them. But Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've, you know, uh, interviewed them for a a documentary film, for newspaper interviews and uh, all that kind of stuff. So I knew them for years. And then... As I became into my came into my own paranormal career, um, I spoke at conferences with like Lorraine, like she was there too. Oh, so fabulous. I was just this kid, you know, from the town yeah. next door, and then I was on the same bill as her, you know, years later. So, um, so that was pretty crazy to know them. Wow. I live about forty minutes from that house. Um, okay. So, uh, and I know the whole Perrin family. I've interviewed them. I've known mainly Andrea, but I know her dad too. And I know the first investigators, Keith and Carl Johnson, that investigated there, and they brought in the Warrens. Okay. So the movie came out, and I'm like, wow, they got nothing right. But I still <laughs> love the movie. Like, uh, I mean, okay, they got the Perrin family in Liberties. Rhode Island, and that's about where it ends. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I still thought the movie was a lot of fun, and um, I've been in the house a number of times. I remember when the movie first came out, and it was October. And, um, this, this woman, I was speaking at a local library and a woman came up to me and she said, Hey, um, my name's Norma Sutcliffe. And I went, Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, I didn't connect for a second. And she goes, I live in the conjuring house. Mm-hmm. And I went, Oh, the movie had just come out. And I said, would you be willing to talk to us about yep. living there? You know, the audience. And she's like, well, only if it comes up. And I'm like, of course, I wouldn't want to force anything. 
And so I went to the front row and I knew this kid that was sitting in the front row. And I said, look, when I ask for questions, you put your hands up and you say, what do you think about the new Conjuring movie? Uh, and I'm like, got it. <laughs> so right on cue, he does his thing. I'm like, wouldn't it be amazing if someone who actually lived there was here? And it was like Elvis just walked in and she's like, <laughs> I'm like, come on up. So I sort of interviewed her in front of the audience. Oh wow! And we talked about, um, you know, living in that house. And you have to remember that house was on the show Ghost Hunters uh, first. Yeah. And this was long before the movie. It was just, hey, our house is haunted. It's a little bit weird. And so Ghost Hunters did an episode there. I found a few weird things. Uh, and and everyone seems to forget about that uh, entirely. And then the movie came out and created a huge problem for Norma and her husband. Oh, yeah. Because this house, nobody cared, folks. This wasn't the Amityville house, right? This wasn't like the Amityville house where people have been driving by it since the 70s mm -hmm. because of this horrible murder that took I, place. I'm one yeah. of them, yes. <laughs> we're, we're all guilty. We, we, yeah. You know, we, I've been Photos. by it a few times. I get it. Yeah. Um, th this wasn't that until after the movie came out. Then it right. became a thing. So uh, really, I don't know, interesting. Ask questions because like, I mean, it's, you know, do you want to contrast the real thing with what happened or the movie? Like we could talk about it either way. Have you, so you've, and so you've met, how many times have you been to the house or been in the house, did you say? Oh, at this point, so we filmed, <laughs> yeah. Ghost Adventures was the first to film after the movie okay. came out. So I was there prepping for that. I've probably been there five or six times since the last, I don't know, four or five years. And it's just like an old, it's an old like 1800s farmhouse, right? Big, big, no, charming, 1700s. Oh, um, even older. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's almost, th uh, I want to say 1730 something. So it's almost 300 years old. Oh my goodness. Um, and it's, it's very nondescript. It's a pretty little property on a quiet road. Yeah. And then you, you, you pull in and when you walk in the house, it's like stepping back in time. It's like stepping back into the 1700s. It's really well-maintained. Um, you know, looks like a great old house, but we got a lot of those around here, you know, like right. it's not that, you know, that unique, but, um, but, but yeah, beautiful little house, uh, that looks kind of nondescript from the outside. What anything at all happened when you were the times you've been there, anything strange to you happen to you? So not, so we, we did a, uh, we did one of our new England legends podcast Halloween specials there live. And, mm -hmm. um, it was like one weird thing. And you know they have cameras set up everywhere because the 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 new owners at the time were turning it into like a, a haunted b and b kind of thing right right and so we were there and um they have cameras in all the rooms to catch whatever weird stuff might be happening and ray and i were sitting at the the dining room table um recording and talking to the the, the new owner and suddenly like this this like thing fell over in the next room and there was no one mm. in there and we looked over and we all saw it and they caught it on camera and I mean, yeah. it's not, I mean, you can't base a horror movie around this, but it was just weird. It's one of those things that it had been standing up all night. There was no wind or anything. And it just sort of fell over. And we're like, huh, that's strange. Another time uh, I was there filming one of the shock docs for Discovery. Oh, and yeah. I was on camera for that. And this this was sort of a funny story. So that day, um, I don't know how many years ago it was, but, um, you know, the producers are like, hey, we're going to film and you know, we're going to interview you in the Conjuring house. I'm like, yeah, great. And uh, I said, look, I have childcare issues. Could I please bring my daughter? She'll just hang out in the kitchen or whatever. And um, and they're like, yeah, of course, no problem at all. And so uh, total lie. I had no childcare issues whatsoever. I was like, Sophie, do you want to go with me to the Conjuring house? <laughs> yep. And she's like, oh, my God, yes. I'm like, you're coming with dad to work. Let's yep. go. So uh, so anyway, so we, we get there and I'm like, look, make sure you use the bathroom before we go home. Like, make sure just promise me she's like yeah okay whatever we were there for like three four hours that she probably went twice and so um so while we were there filming uh two weird things happened number one like all the kitchen cabinets were suddenly open mm. um and that was a little bit weird but the other strange thing was that there there was an overhead light in the upstairs room right above where we were filming and it was flashing on and off on and off and it, what happened was they have a floor vent and the slightest bit of light was flashing. And one of the camera people who's watching the monitor so closely, they're like, hey, there's something sort of weird going on. So we go upstairs and it, it's just right in front of you, on, off, a perfect rhythm, like yeah. one second, one second, one second. One, and you're just going, and, and and the owner was there and we're like, what is this, right? I mean, that, I, I, and honestly, my first thought isn't paranormal. It's just like, you are we this could be a fire hazard like i don't know like this yeah. is an old house you know Seriously, i mean right um and then eventually it just kind of stopped and i i have no idea what would have caused that that's not i i don't that's not like paranormal occurrences i've seen before 
it but it was unique it was weird it was different and it yeah. the crew that was there was just freaked out um oh, they were yeah. scared because anything strange was just rattling them um but anyway so those are the the two things they're minor but like you know stuff doesn't fall over stuff. my house for no reason yeah, me either. I, not yet. Yeah. Least, I think so. That's interesting. Um, you're a fan of the film. Okay. And have you seen all the sequels, Conjuring 2 and everything that I talk about all the, you know, I don't know. There's so many of them. Now I think I lost track of them. Yeah. So I, I do think it's worth mentioning. So um, Ed and Lorraine were, were showmen. And when I was growing yeah. up, they were very much regional celebrities. You yes. know, like yes. there weren't paranormal reality shows like today. There wasn't the internet. No, it was man. just, you know, like these guys were just putting themselves out there, you know, like, hey, we're the freaks that look into ghosts. Um, his license plate literally said ghosts, right? I like you, <laughs> you, I mean, when they drove by, you're like, is that Ed? And, yep, that's, that's. Oh, yes, it's ghosts. Of course yeah, it is. <laughs> ghosts, vanity plate right there. So um, <laughs> I have two sidebar. I have two sidebar questions for Ed and for them, though. Yeah. One, did, did you ever get to go into the Amityville house on Ocean Avenue? And two, do they still have like a paranormal museum or something? Didn't they have one for a while? Yeah. So uh, I went to college uh, in, at Hofstra University on Long Island. And so yeah. the first time I drove by the Amityville house, I was a freshman and a friend's like, oh, I'm from Amityville. And he's like, you want to go see the house? I was like, yes, yes I, I do. Go see the house. <laughs> um, and then um, I, for one of my books, I had the chance to uh, interview George Lutz for oh, wow. hours and it was the last interview he ever gave on amityville and we talked about okay. everything from like the summer of 75 all oh, the way man. to um the, the third movie that had come out yeah. and his intent to get arrested at the premiere and um <laughs> because he was just livid about the way he was being portrayed in this movie yeah and so i never i don't even know anyone that's been allowed inside that house it's a private residence they despise right. the haunted reputation mm -hmm. when you pull over and take a picture from the street which is legal by the way um they still hate it and they'll scream at you oh, yeah. and get the hell yeah. out um and this go dude this goes on all the time not just oh, halloween june I am, december I went doesn't by matter there well, the time that i went was in may and i was the guy i got out and i was walking around the street like an idiot and I was there for probably 10 minutes. I was in the public street. I wasn't doing anything illegal. But I swear four people during that 20-whatever minute stop and take photos. It is literally nonstop. Yes, it is nonstop. nonstop. Um, and what's interesting Amazing. is I mean, it's called a stigmatized property. And this brings up like I, – I, this I, lo I love everything about the paranormal. I love not just like the, the stuff that bumps in the night, but like the, the rabbit holes you go down legally and of uh, emotionally and spiritually mm -hmm. and everything else. And so if you own that Amityville house and you're going to sell it, you must disclose, although I don't know anyone who wouldn't know at this point, but you'd have I to disclose <laughs> to the buyer, this is the Amityville house. Six people were murdered here. Everyone thinks it's haunted. If yeah. you buy this house, you buy all the baggage that goes with it. And people have to understand that. The Conjuring house was not a stigmatized property, mm. but it is now. Yes. And so that's like, so, I mean, I don't know if there were attempted lawsuits against the movie. The movie company paid the parent family they paid the warrens the people that own the house got nothing and pretty soon the internet was like hey this is where the house is and everybody mm -hmm. went looking for it and it was horrible problems for uh, the people who live there and like Bathsheba oh, yeah. Sherman was never in that house uh, mm -hmm. there's no connection to it um, Ed and Lorraine Warren how the story really ended was that uh, they were doing a seance and at some point something overtook Mrs. Perrin and, and so Roger went over to help his wife and Ed pushed him aside and said, no, you don't touch someone when they're under, you know, demonic influence. And then Roger punched Ed in the face and said, get the hell out of my house and you're never welcome back again. That's how it ended. Good. Wow. <laughs> A little different than the movie. So, yeah, that was the thing was, yeah, you know, how much, you know, about this backstory, how much is true, you know. What happened to, you know, to the parent? How did this thing even get, I guess that's where he wanted to go was how did it even get started for those folks that have no idea? I mean, yeah. What is like the quick, like elevator pitch story of well, what happened to those folks? Right? So, uh, okay. What happened to the movie? Like, well, what happened in real life? And I'm using okay. air quotes for those that can't see me. <laughs> sure. So in, in real life, yeah. uh, the parents moved in there in the early 1970s. Okay. Right. And the day they were moving in, the uh, former owner was still moving out, which, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a pain in the butt. What are you going to do? Um, and I, Andrea, to, Andrea told me that they were, the kids were bringing in boxes from the truck into the kitchen. And she said, there was a man standing there, uh, looked sort of old fashioned, brown shirt and pants and everything. And she just assumed he was with the guy that was still moving out. And um, by the time her youngest sister went in with a box, 
uh, the guy just sort of vanished in front of her. And she's like, uh, what was that? There was a man here and now there isn't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they believe that was Mr. Arnold. It was known as the Arnold estate for the longest time. And in fact, we found his grave. He's buried in the woods, by the way, like a, a small family plot that's on private property. We asked permission. The owners let us cut through to get to it. Wow. Um, like 25 graves in back there. And we found it. It's all overgrown. Um, that's who the parents always believed was haunting their house was was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Arnold. And that's that's was day one. And as as um, the old owner was leaving, he pulled Roger aside and said, listen, for the sake of your family, keep the lights on at night. Mm. And so he figured that was his warning. Now, in the beginning, they were scared. You know, they would there's two sets of uh, stairs going to the upstairs um, area and the kids would hear footsteps coming up. And they said they never knew if that was like mom and dad coming to get them for dinner or if no one was there at all. And so they would hear these footsteps. Um, they would hear knocks on the wall. The, the weirdest thing that Andrea told me was that her youngest sister sat up one night in bed and in a very metallic voice started saying, there's seven dead soldiers buried in the wall. Mm. And like, that's weird. Now, having been through the building, yeah. the walls aren't that thick. There's no way there's one body in the walls, let alone seven. But there is like this old stone retaining wall right outside. I don't know. I mean, I can't promise you there's no one buried there. I can't promise you there is, but, yeah. um, but that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the building you go down in the basement and in the back, there's this well that looks right down, like, I don't know, 10, 15 feet to water. And it's this mm. stone. Well, I mean, you've seen this movie too, <laughs> the ring, right? Like yeah, you're yeah. just waiting for the, the girl to crawl out with the hair <laughs> right. in front of her face. I mean, it is eerie, but it's right there oh, in yeah. the basement and it's these old timbers, like real trees that were yeah. used as opposed to like lumber, uh, yeah. a lot of old stones and things like that. And so the whole house definitely has a vibe to it mm. and plenty of people are having experiences. And at this point, the legend, the movie, the fiction, the reality have all just been thrown in a blender there yeah. um, to the point I where, I, I mean, I couldn't, we could, I don't think we could identify it at this point, but the simplest thing I can tell you, it is a thing. <laughs> now it is a thing. Who is the current owner now? Do you say they were trying to make some sort of attraction out of it or something? And they did, and then they sold it again for oh, wow. a hefty profit. Oh, uh, I, I think imagine. like last year. I don't know the. I I knew the Norma and her and her husband. Mm -hmm. I knew the owners just before, and then I don't I don't know who bought it now. But I think the previous owners are still involved, um, and they're they're basically making it like a haunted B and B um, is, yeah. is the plan. So I haven't been there. In, I don't know a little while now. So the funny thing with me is like once I've done a story, I've done it. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't have I don't have a real cause to keep going back. So um, sure. it, it's interesting. It made the pop culture. Like I said, it was Ed and Lorraine Warren. And and, it, and, and here's the other funny thing. When I was um, when I would see Ed and Lorraine Warren speak as a teenager, this was not a case they ever talked about. Really? Because it wasn't that big of a deal. It was mm, nothing yeah. compared to Amityville. It was nothing right, compared right. to the Lindley Street haunting in right. Bridgeport, Connecticut. How that hasn't been made into a movie yet. I don't know. Um, yeah. but like that one was the one where they were just like, they would put up newspaper clips and interviews with police officers and fire department, you know, uh, officials who said, I, you know, I watched a refrigerator levitate in the kitchen and, you know, right. really compelling stuff. Those were the cases they talked about. Never this one, but they also talked about Annabelle. And I think yeah. what happened was, yeah. I mean, and now this is like the TV producer and me talking now. <laughs> I think what happened was this Annabelle story is so compelling, so freaky and they wanted to do something with it. And at the time, they didn't think Annabelle could carry her own movie. Uh, so they started the Conjuring movie with this like 10 minute short uh, or whatever, however long it was, that had nothing to do with the, the parent story. It was just sort of stuffed in there. And um, yeah. I, I think it was just like the ultimate test audience. You know what I mean? Like they wanted to do a whole movie on Annabelle. And they said, well, let's do this. And if the audience loves it, we'll give them Annabelle as like their own movie later. That's my suspicion. But that's thinking like a capitalist, not a storyteller. And oh, well, that's how they make money and they make these movies. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, and of course, the real Annabelle didn't look like that. The real Annabelle no. was a Raggedy Ann doll. Raggedy Ann doll. That's right. Exactly yeah. right. Um, you mentioned haunted B&B. So we'll continue our road trip and we're going to go to Massachusetts where there is a, well, I can't say it's haunted, but it's a B&B. If a lot of people may, I don't know, if everyone heard of Lizzie, Lizzie Borden's story out there, I don't know if they have. Um, that happened in Fall River, Massachusetts, 
Why don't you tell people about Lizzie Borden and the of the uh, the interesting story about what happened with her? Sure. So first of all, um, there's a nursery rhyme that we teach our kids around yes, here. There is. Uh, <laughs> Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave yep. her father 40 wax and when she saw what she had done she gave her mother 41 <laughs> very good and idea. um uh, which is a gross exaggeration it was only like 17 wax yeah uh, but you know for you know, but it doesn't rhyme uh right. 17 i would still put in the crime of passion uh, uh you know uh category so uh it was uh, august of 1892 and there's this house in fall river massachusetts which is down on the coast um not too far from providence rhode island yep and the Bordens are a very influential family. He's wealthy, but he's like a tight miser. And by the way, uh, it was not her mother. That was her stepmother. Uh, Abby Borden was Lizzie's stepmother, yes. which is sort of important to the story. So one day, um, the only two people in the house are Abby and the maid, Bridget, and, um, and then Mr. and Mrs. Borden. And according to Lizzie, she went outside uh, to the backyard to pick some pears and then go up into their barn to get some fishing weights for some uh, trip she had coming up. She was gone in the backyard just 10, 15 minutes. She came inside and found someone had uh, bludgeoned her father to, to death while he lay taking a nap on, in the parlor. And then upstairs, uh, her stepmother had been bludgeoned to death with an ax and was found dead on the floor. Someone broke in the house, stole nothing, uh, no sign of struggle. And these two people are dead in a very short period of time. And the maid said she knows nothing. And, and uh, Lizzie said she knows nothing. And this was like the crime of the century. Mm -hmm. Because Lizzie, I mean, the, the he was old too. It's not like Andrew Borden was like a spring chicken. He was old. So you could say, well, maybe he was going to change his will. And Lizzie wasn't going to get what she wanted. Lizzie was uh, young 30s, I believe, at the time. Yeah. So not married. Um, a lot of people suspect that she was gay. And possibly having a, a relationship with the maid, yep. um, and that, and the maid kept her silence for that reason. Uh, we don't know, but we do know and, that it went to court, and you can all the court documents are there online. You can read them. You know, uh, Lizzie says like, "Oh, that day she got some paint on a dress, so she decided to burn it, which is why the dress she was wearing isn't available for them to look at." Right. Like, like so many things where you're like, yeah. "Huh? You know, we don't right. need Columbo on this one. I think <laughs> right. I got this right. I think the right. Keystone cops could solve this one." You know, exactly. It's, <laughs> and so all the circumstantial evidence pointed to Lizzie, but then the all male jury was like, "Ah, I don't, I don't think a woman could have done this." And I'm like, have you known any women? Like, I don't know, like who you roll with, but, um, mm -hmm. but anyway, so Lizzie gets off and everybody assumes her guilt the rest of her days. Yep. And she's even buried in the family plot right next to the people she most likely either killed or had a hand nah, in killing. That's, and yeah. then the story just never, ever went away. There's the nursery rhyme. There's the song, you know, uh, which is just a hysterical song. You can hear it online. Lizzie Borden, uh, one day in old fall river, Mr. Andrew Borden died. Yep. Um, and then, um, it's been done as a metal version, which is awesome. And it's been made into movies. Elizabeth Montgomery bewitched, um, yep. uh, played Lizzie Borden in one of those movies. And, and, uh, Christina Ricci did. Um, so that was the one that I was yeah. going to bring up. It, it is. Yeah. This is, Oh, this was ooh, maybe all 10 years ago. Now mm -hmm. it was like a mini series. And it was just, it got very little publicity. No one, it was incredibly violent. Like, oh my God, violent. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was excellent. How accurate was it? Oh, I don't know necessarily, but it sure was, um, it sure was graphic. I can say that yeah, much. yeah. So, so that this case, and you know what? Here's the thing. I promise you it's going to come up again. Like, oh, yeah, someone will make that movie again. That'll get in someone's craw that, hey, we haven't we haven't trucked out Lizzie Borden in a while. Uh, yep. Let's do it again. And this time we'll have someone else play it, you know. And so um, you'll see it come around because the thing about an unsolved murder, this is an unsolved murder from 1892 and it still yep. haunts us. Yep. And of course, the house, it's a B&B. &B. They meticulously have done this place over to look like it's 1892. You yep. can stay there in the room where, where Abby was killed. You can sit on a couch that looks exactly <laughs> that, like the one Andrew was killed that on. Is and so weird crazy. stuff happens in there. Yeah. So that that's the, so like I said, I love to visit New England, I love to visit Massachusetts. And I don't I I can't tell you why I've never been there. I just haven't been yet. I don't know why I haven't gone yet. Next time, right? I keep saying that. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, that you can really stay in the room where this woman got murdered. Like that's the thing people forget about these stories. We talked about Amityville a little bit. We talked about, you know, the like you can say what you want about the stories and the movies, but these people actually got killed here. People really died in these places. 
And that is spooky stuff. And they, you know, she was brutally murdered. And so was, so was the husband. He was brutally murdered. And yeah, the, it's like the, to have that stuff there is, oh man, whoo, that's intense, right? And the crime scene photos are in the rooms where it happened. So like, yeah. should you have, have forgotten, right? It's mounted on the wall where you can yeah. see like Abby laying down dead. Um, yes. They used to, uh, God, the, the owner that I was really closer with, like she passed away sadly a, a oh, little okay. bit ago. And I remember, um, you know, she would answer the phone. I'd be in the office hanging out with her and she would like the phone would ring someone making a reservation. And she'd be like, Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast where we treat you like family. And I'm like, <laughs> I, that's good. It never got old. Every time I heard it, I would yeah. laugh and laugh and laugh. That's good. Uh, but that was so one what, of those places where, you know, God, it, 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 here's one of the things too. And, and, and can we talk about Amityville for a second? I know it's not New England, but I love Amityville. Anytime you want to talk Amityville, let's go. So George Lutz, um, here's what I'm, 90 percent sure happened and by the way i also know his son his stepson christopher lutz who okay. uh, lived in the house and so everyone sort of agrees weird stuff happened in that house and that all the books including jay anson's book and all the movies have mm -hmm. been sort of like a gross exaggeration mm -hmm. and this is what people forget and this is what um so people who love the horror genre and i do i really do i, I love the real stuff and i love the horror genre and i understand as a storyteller a real haunting is so much more frightening because if you walk, Eddie, I'm going to rip off an Eddie Murphy joke right here. You walk right. into the house, the blood's coming out of the walls, the doors are trying to eat you, you're out. That's it. You turn <laughs> yeah. around, you get yeah. a hotel, the movie yeah. is 30 seconds long and you roll credits and everybody wants their money back, right? Right. A real haunting is so much more subtle. So George Lutz said at one point, I said, well, you, you, he knew what the house he was buying. He knew the DeFeo murders happened there. He wasn't tricked. Uh, the, the house value came way down. He he was uh, coming out of a divorce. His wife, Kathy, was coming out of divorce. They were selling yep. their two houses. They could pool their money and buy this really nice house at a cheap price. And as he said, houses don't have memories. That's what they mm -hmm. thought. Yeah. And so he they move in and he said it was like the first night in the house. He heard what sounded like a marching band downstairs in the living yes, room tuning heard up. That. <laughs> and, and I'm like, okay, like that's, that's weird. And so he gets up. That? So like, to me, this is really frightening, even though it sounds silly. So I you know. get up and you walk down the stairs and then, and then he sees his black lab asleep at the bottom of the stairs. So now you go, wait a minute. If there was noise, if there was a radio playing or Damn. something outside, the dog would be up. The dog would be so. barking. And now, uh oh, is this in my head or is this really happening? And now you start to question your sanity. And so it's little subtle things that just chip away at you. That's so much more frightening than just blood coming out of the walls. Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Oh, and all the crazy things. Yeah, because, yeah, you don't, you, like you said, you think you're crazy. Then no one believes. You don't want to tell anyone these things. You don't want to share it with anybody. So when you talked to him, did, what was your take on that? Did you believe, did you believe the stuff he was, he was saying, the stuff that he and his wife, the Kathy, were talking about? Do you think it was real? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. look, I'm into this stuff. I don't want to live there. Six people were murdered there, like by the, by the brother slash son. And that's right? the movie. So that's the movie that I want. I want someone to make the film about the DeFeos. That's what I, I don't want like just, just like a, a, you know, a quick little flashback scene of it. I want that film to see, because no one's really ever done that before. No, I, I'm not that I'm aware of. No, not a, not a no. big one. Um, no. But yeah, no, you're right. And so, this story just doesn't end, right? And then the movie no. started getting made. So, for example, like the room with the flies in it, which was mm -hmm. from the, the first the book and from the uh, the first movie, the swarm yep. of flies. Yep. Dude, I don't care what house I'm living in. If there is a swarm of flies, I'm out until it's fumigated. Like I'm yeah. out the door. Not someone come there. handle this. <laughs> yeah, not not living there. But George said, "I said, tell me about the flies." He said, "We had one room where there was always one or two flies, and you'd swat them." And they're dead and you clean them up and you throw them out with a tissue or whatever. And then like a few hours later, there's another damn fly in that room. We could never seem to get the flies out. Now, mm -hmm. the movie makers exaggerated that 10 million fold, of right? Course. Of course. Um, because that seems more, more scary. Whereas, I don't know, if you're a really good storyteller, I think one fly that just doesn't go away could, could be, you know... I mean, remember the movie Bug, right? Like, where you're just, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, where you're just like, oh, the fly, yes. right? Like, one a swarm, you're like, something's really wrong. I'm out of here. Like, hello, exterminator, come bomb this place. <laughs> right. uh, but so, so the reality was a lot more subtle. 
Um, but still enough to drive them out of the house. And then I suspect he sold the rights to that story to the book publisher who had Jay Anson write that book. And they had no idea that it was going to become such a big uh, hit mm, and then movie crazy. franchise. And so he sold the rights to his story. And then I think he spent the rest of his days standing up saying, this is my story and, right. and getting lawsuit after lawsuit about who has the right to tell his story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and being, imagine being told you're a liar your whole adult life. Yeah. Like everywhere. Oh, you're the guy that lied about Amityville. Like you weren't yeah. there, you know, yeah. he was, and it just that, gets that's a terribly, oh, terribly old. And yeah, I mean, I, so you mentioned the, the thing about, um, his, one of his stepsons. I never even thought about their kids. Do they have any sort of, do they speak on the behalf of because George and Kathy are both passed away now. Do those kids speak on their behalf about anything? Do they ever talk to them? I feel like I never, I've never heard anything about them. So Chris, uh, uh, one of the, there's two brothers and a, a sister, and those were all Kathy's kids. Okay. Um, yeah. So the the sister has never spoken, as far as I'm aware of, uh, anywhere. One brother made like a documentary on Amityville, and then the okay. other brother, Chris, that I've I've known, he spoke about it at a couple like paranormal conferences and stuff, mm. and he talked about it just from his his angle. He viewed um, what was happening as something that he thought George brought in with his transcendental meditation practices mm, interesting. that he thought like his dad's his stepdad rather had uh, sort of opened something up in the house. Chris said weird things happen, but he thinks, you know, that his um, his parents exaggerated it. The movies exaggerated it. And also he was very young. He was like five or six. Yeah. And his childhood was kind of robbed from him because the book came out and suddenly his his Kathy and George are on like tours telling yep. the story to the media. Yep. He's getting made fun of at school. Yeah. Oh, you're a liar. You live in that haunted house. You guys are full of it. You know, um, and he's he sort of had to carry that his his whole life as well. So he's like the curse of this, uh, you know, this, you know this thing it, it it's it was so much so one of the first times i was hanging out with chris he pulled out his credit card and you know on the back of a credit card there's the security code where you sign it sure, sure. he's like look at my credit card and his security code was 112 are you and serious for those that don't know 112 ocean oh avenue God, was the original yes. he goes this follows me everywhere oh to this God. day and i was like oh my god <laughs> that's that's crazy i know i'm like that's a little weird Oh my! Of course, they changed the address, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, it's um, not one twelve anymore. So no. if you go to the one, but it doesn't matter. So, like you know, no, it doesn't matter. It's the same house. So yeah, it's it's the same house, and his credit card says one twelve, and I'm just like, yeah, that I would have just called the credit card company. Yeah, like, I have a new card. It was stolen. <laughs> just send me a new one. They'll do it. No questions asked. They'll, I really they'll, need a new card. Is not cancel work. that one. They'll send you a new one tomorrow. No big deal. It'll have a different I security code. I love it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um. I, that was a fun tangent, though. I love it. But um, yeah, so uh, Lizzie Borden has. So how many times have you worked in the house? How many times have you done stuff in the house and anything cool happened to you there? Yeah. So Lizzie Borden, I've been in there a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I, I couldn't tell you how many times over the years. The first time I was in there, uh, we were doing a live radio broadcast um, and we had the house. There's four of us. We had the house for the mm, night because they were nice. doing some minor remodeling, just painting and stuff. And so uh, Leanne, who had the place at the time, she's like, yeah, just don't break anything. And she was awesome. So uh, we were doing like the live broadcast. We're walking around the house. Four of us are in the basement. And suddenly we hear these like scampering footsteps from the side door into the kitchen right above our heads. Mm. And we all look at each other like, oh, no. And no one's thinking ghost. Everybody thinks some kids from Fall River just broke in. It's not the sure. greatest neighborhood that this house is oh, in. Okay. So, so we race up the stairs. I mean, five seconds pass between hearing it because we're like we got to call the cops we got to manhandle them out whatever right, right. and you check the door and it's locked and you go okay mm, that's right. weird we all heard it we all reacted the same way right um you know i i know people that have worked there and seen stuff like levitate like like pictures come off the wall or whatever uh but then when we filmed ghost adventures there um <clears throat> the next day this this didn't make it into the episode like the crew was done they were finished they went home everybody was gone and Leanne's like, what did your guys do in here? And I'm like, what do you mean? Is something broken? Like, we'll take care of it. I'm sorry. Mm. And she said, no, you got to see the back door. And so I, I went down there and the back door leads down like three steps into the basement, just a couple of steps. And you're it's, it's not a bulkhead. It's a door. But anyway, um, and then there's another door. So there's a tiny little area in there uh, toward the basement between two doors, an exterior one and an interior one. 
And the exterior door, the one that faces the, the back parking lot, has got like, no joke, like 15, 20 big black flies all over oh. the inside of the thing. And I filmed wow. it with my phone. I took my phone out. I'm like, this is Amityville. Again, we're back, right? Ah, yeah, so, it flies again. And we're coming around. So I'm filming it and I'm like, this is really weird. I mean, it's so I was like, okay. She's like, well, let's open the door. I, there must be a dead mouse in there or something, right? Whatever. Right, right. So we open the door, the flies shoo out or whatever. And and it's we're talking about three steps, two feet or so, and then another door. It's a tiny area to, to explore. It, mm -hmm. Scan your head. Look all around. No dead mouse. No dead nothing. Uh, just these black flies the night after we investigated Man. to this day. I don't know. She would, she would show me like voicemails that she got from like these like creepy robotic voices from unknown numbers. And just something weird was always happening inside that place. Okay. And I remember Leanne telling me her first night there, uh, she slept in the upstairs bedroom and they had an antique rocking chair in the corner and she was staring at it before she went to bed and she got up and it was moved next to the bed. And wow. so she's like, okay, she just got up to use the bathroom. So she puts the chair back, goes to the bathroom, goes back to bed, stares at the rocking chair. And when she wakes up, the chair is right next to the bed again. And I'm just like, mm. yeah, that's, that's checkmate for most of us. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's yeah, a little uh, bit, right? Just, I mean, oh, stuff goodness. happens. And at this <laughs> yeah, point, it's amazing. so many people have come to that house expecting something Enough that I think that we bring our own attachments in there with us at this point. It's like when you want to see a sea monster. If you go to Loch Ness, you're gonna have this preposition your brain to see the monster, even though you, yeah, you just you're, you're you're like programmed to do it for some thing. Yeah, yeah, no, but it's it's a crazy place, and and again, you know, it comes up again and again. Um, on local haunts, people have experiences, and the legend just keeps going around. Leanne doesn't own it anymore; it's now new owners, and they they're still doing tours, uh, tours, yeah. and or you can stay yeah. over, um, and then you know people go there, and that's the thing, right? Like, so you watch a horror movie. And you like them because it's a work of fiction. You can suspend your disbelief. You can get scared, but in a safe way. It's like being on a roller coaster. You know, yep. you're not going to fly off, hopefully. Yep. Yeah. But it's it's a it's a thrill ride the, to evoke some of these like powerful places and primal places in the human like experience, it. like yes. murder and death and mm -hmm. and fear of of like these horrible monsters that are out there. Yeah. Um. I get that. I totally get it. But then you go to the place where it happened where the monster really was real, like killed yeah. two people with an ax. That was real. And you, you become part of the story. And that's what intrigues us, right? When we go to these places, you want to become part of the story. You just, mm -hmm. you drove by Amityville because you wanted to become part mm -hmm. of the story. Mm -hmm. You right. took your pictures, you stood in front of the house because mm -hmm. you're like, here I am, like ground yeah. zero. Yes. And, um, and now that's, that's part of you. And you were there and you, you wrote a little, a little name in the log book, like the, right. the you know, the metaphorical one. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's that's how this stuff works. So that is will be the next trip. I I, I, I will finally make it to the Lizzie Porter <laughs> bed and breakfast. <laughs> so we'll finish our trip up to lovely New England. We'll go to a state that I love as just as much, and we'll go to Maine. Yes, and I'm going to go to Maine to something that okay, so not necessarily completely unique to that. I think it's the more we talked about maybe parts of Canada and maybe parts of the plains and things like that. But how about the story of the Wendigo? That's where I associate it with just because of, well, fictitious Pet Cemetery, which I love the book and the movie so much, plays a big part in the story, Algernon Blackwood's story. But what about the Wendigo, the shapeshifter or the cannibal? What do you what, what do you think about that story? So we've got um, through through Native American lore, the lot of Native Algonquin American people, lore, yes. the, you know, the Wampanoag, like there are there are tons of legends about um you know, the, the shapeshifter skinwalker, right? Like mm -hmm. Wendigo, like it goes by various names depending on which part of the country you're in. Yeah. Um, but the description is, is very similar. And to me, that's, that's the interesting thing that someone has been influenced by, um, you know, by, by events and by history and lore that's actually happened. So the Wendigo is more related when people who study folklore, it's more related to the great plains but there was a creature up in Maine, um, Mount Katahdin, the uh, tallest mountain in Maine, called the Pomola, which was a, uh, a bird man mm. that guards the mountain, right? Um, and then there's also like, like man-eating rocks up there. There's like people disappear. There are, there are stories and monsters lurking in the woods. And I'm certain it, it influenced those authors. It influenced Stephen King. It influenced yeah. so many people that, that you know, 
made these things into movies and into popular culture and to, you know, whatever else. But the crazy thing to me is how come, you know, these cultures that we, we, we suspect had no contact with each other, right? We don't think that right. they were, you were jumping on the cell phone in the American no. Southwest <laughs> and calling Maine, right? Yeah. But they have these similar creatures just with different names using their own local name, but same description. And not only that, uh, sometimes they show up in like Ireland and in the Gaelic regions of Europe, even yeah. in Africa, over in Alaska, you know, in Asia, right? These monsters have, they turn up in, in cultures that we don't think had any contact with each other. Sure. And so is there some collective consciousness thing here? Or this is where it gets really weird. Is there really something lurking out there that's elusive, that's stranger than we can possibly understand? And it gets labeled because it makes us feel better to give something a label. And then our imaginations run with it from there. And then we, you know, we make movies about it and books about it. And, you know, and we, we talk about it. And sometimes people like me even go up into the woods and go looking for it. I'd like to go looking for it too. So you wouldn't be alone. <laughs> yeah, the, the, it's, I mean, you go, the, you go in the woods and you're like, yeah. do you really think you're going to see like, oh man, I'm so bummed, Matt, we were there all day. Not one Wendigo. I mean, we saw two Bigfoot. No, right. That was cool. Yeah, but we weren't, we weren't looking for him. So who, we didn't even bother with the camera. So that's a good question. How do you feel about the thought of Bigfoots in Maine on the East Coast? What are your thoughts on that? There you go. We've got stories, right? There's, uh, there's a great story in Massachusetts in uh, North Adams, which is the very uh -huh. western part of the state right near sure. Albany. Yeah. And there's a, a, a big stone ledge that overlooks the town. And it's called Coca-Cola Ledge because way back when Coca-Cola painted a, a billboard on it. But there's the monster of Coca-Cola Ledge. And by all accounts, it's a Bigfoot. Like it's a big, tall, hairy, you know, creature. And the thing about Coca-Cola Ledge is it's very gentle hills on either side. So you can walk to the top very easily, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, I mean, it's, if you fall from the top, you're done. That's a, yeah, that's yeah, a yeah. lethal drop. <laughs> sure. And so part of it, uh, is it parents sharing the story to try to keep kids from staying away from up there, mm -hmm, which yeah. would have done the opposite effect on me. I'm like, wait, there's yeah, a big too. foot up there. Like, <laughs> I'm going tomorrow. <laughs> I'll go pack a lunch. We're going yeah, up. We're going to go too. looking for this thing. Uh, so like, so like, but you know, he shows up, he shows up on October mountain. Uh, he shows up. Um, there's something called big Harry of Cedar swamp in central Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Bigfoot stories appear here as they do, uh, not as prolifically as maybe like the American, or the Pacific, you know, Northwest, but yeah, we've got them here too, for sure. That's awesome. So let me wrap up with this. I have a quick question for you. So someone wants to listen to us two crazy people and they listen to this episode and they say, I'm going to go up to New England and explore things. Three things, three places you can tell somebody that are easily available, that aren't dangerous, that isn't trespassing. Where do you suggest three places people can go to check out some three cool stories? What, what would you say? This is going to sound like such an awful plug, but okay. we have this free app called the New England Legends app that's there got a map go. to like to like 300 <laughs> stories that we've covered. So wherever you are, you can click on a pin, hear the story, get driving directions. Most of the stories we cover Good. are public places anyway. Um, but I would say like, I think, you know, top three, you know, I mean, Lizzie Borden is does make yep. most people's lists. Salem. Salem has got, you could, you can knock a lot of stuff out and Salem. We could have talked Salem all day. Yeah. Right. Obviously. I mean, <laughs> you've got the witch stuff, you've got the haunted Hawthorne house and the yep. house of seven mm -hmm. gables and the Hawthorne yep. hotel. And, Love um, it. you know, th there's the old ship there is there's, there's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of great stuff and pirate history too. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, oh God. And then in Lynn woods, there's, um, there's, there's a, a cave that was dug by a man being directed by spirits to look for gold. And, there's, and it's mm. on a public park. It's it's the the uh, pirates' cave in Lynn, and it's uh, and it's it's accessible. You can actually go into the cave. Hiram Marble was told by spirits, if you dig through this rock, you will find gold. People sponsored him. He spent his whole life, decades digging, and uh, never found the gold. But had he found it, like you know, that would have been Mecca, right? That would have been Jerusalem yeah. for spiritualists. <laughs> Absolutely, um, that's a really cool place to visit. Um, oh my gosh, there's uh, the Mount Washington hotel in, in New Hampshire. Oh yeah, sure. You know, uh, sure. if you've seen the shining, mm -hmm. which, uh, I've been to the, you know, the Stanley, the Stanley hotel yeah. in Estes Park, yeah. Colorado, many times the wa Mount Washington looks like it's much bigger brother. Yes. Um, yes, the, it does. It, lo it looks like it's the same architect, big you white do. and red building, grand yep. hotel, Very cool. you know, haunted throughout by the princess. When you check in, there's oh, yeah. literally a, a, a painting of the princess who said to haunt the place looking down at you. Very cool. Um, you know, that's a good one. 
we've got so many great uh, Mount Katahdin, which is the end of the, um, yeah. um, what's, what's the trail that runs from Georgia to Maine? Um, uh, Alp uh, the uh, Appalachian Trail. Appalachian Trail? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. the Appalachian Trail finishes at the top of Mount Katahdin. You can look yes. for the Pomola mm -hmm. when you get up there after walking from Georgia. Great, one of the great places to watch the sunrise in the east there because it's one of the first places that gets the light, right, or something. I yeah, think. It's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, we've got so many. I mean, whatever you're into, if you're into monsters, <laughs> sure. UFOs, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, the UFO yes. abduction case. That's a good one. I don't That's know how that one. hasn't been made into a movie yet. Um, Didn't you guys do an episode recently on uh, Vermont, somewhere UFOs in Vermont or some sort of? There was a, a radar base in Vermont. Yeah. And um, and this is where that UFO was first spotted, right That's like it. an hour before the abduction of Betty and Barney Hill. And one of my favorite things about that story, there's a there's a sign on Route 3. New Hampshire's got these great signs. They're, they're uh, cast iron. They're well-maintained and painted. Um, yeah. and, and there's a sign right on route three that says, this is the site of the alleged Betty and Barney Hill uh, abduction. Cool. And the best part about it, the, the, the total bury the lead on the whole thing is that New Hampshire taxpayers paid for that sign. I love it. I would say, <laughs> I, I would gladly have that. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, and, uh, one more monsters, uh, I'm, I'm way past three at this point, go to Lake Champlain. In New Hampshire, oh. and look for Champy the Lake Monster, yes. our own version of Loch Ness Monster. I have lucky enough. I was there when I was a kid, and uh, I was like seven or eight, and I thought I was going to catch him with a stick in a Dunkin' Donuts bag. Clearly, that did not work because um, no. I would have been rich by now, but I gave it a shot. So Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and that's one of those stories that just comes up again and again, you know, the idea of a lake monster. And, mm -hmm. and of course, people drown. People disappear. Um, and not, and on the New York side of, of the lake, there's a sign yep. where, where everybody's got their name and their, their famous sighting of champion. Like on this date, this person says he saw it, you know, and, yep. uh, right. and, and, and there's a, um, a triple a baseball team, you know, the, yeah. the champions, the mascot. It's amazing. Yep. Yeah. They love it. I, I, I love it. I think that's so great. Um, Jeff Belanger, he is our guest today. He is the host of new England legends. It's a podcast. It's a regional TV show. It's on Amazon prime. Where else, Jeff, can people find you? Where can they look you up? Where else can they find about you? Yeah, well, my website's my name, jeffbelander.com, and you can find me on uh, Exploring Legends on uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram, and I'm on Twitter as well. And uh, always looking for weirdness, you know, still working yes. for Ghost Adventures after 15 years. Amazing Good. how long that right. show's been going. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's like having five full-time jobs, which is just great. <laughs> That's good. Well, thank you for being on. This was fun. I learned a bunch. Hopefully you folks listened as well. Um, of course, check out Jeff everywhere else we just mentioned. Don't forget to like and follow us. Send us your emails, the scary movie project at gmail.com. Do you want to talk more about this? Do you want us to talk about more movies that related to New England? We could go on to that. There's always things for us to talk about. Rate us, love us, tell your friends about us, please. Um, and until next time, we'll see you in the funnies. The Scary Movie Project Podcast. Learn more at thescarymovieproject.com.